So I want to talk a bit about the work I'm, I'm doing here and more broadly uh, uh, back in Australia as well on this concept of the Anthropocene, uh, which is um, really creating quite a stir in, in the scientific uh, research community and beyond because of its implications. So I'm going to talk really about three aspects. First of all, the Earth system science aspect, which would be very close to what, um, what you're doing here because the Earth system, in fact, is the largest social ecological system on the planet. Uh, and it's uh, within that context that the Anthropocene has risen. But then I'll talk about the stratigraphic perspective because uh, as the name indicates, this has geological implications and the geologists are, are getting stuck into it too and I'll bring you up to date on what they're doing. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about where we might be going in, in the future with the Anthropocene, which is some work that's directly um, occurring uh, here at the Resilience Center. So let's get started with the first bit. And again, the point that comes as no surprise to you, but comes to surprise a lot of my scientific colleagues, is that the planet is a single system, the Earth system. It's not plural, although there are subsystems that we often think about. But even at the planetary scale, we can talk about a single social ecological system, which we call the Earth system. There's some really lovely evidence for that from the ice core record. This is an Antarctic ice core record. And if you just look at the middle, the red line, that's a 400,000 year proxy uh, record for temperature. And so you can see quite clearly the systemic behavior of warm periods, ice ages, warm periods, ice ages, on about 100,000 year time intervals. Absolutely classic system behavior. And I'll talk about the other two a little bit later. But for the moment, just think about temperature because we can use that as a metric that that roughly describes the, the state of the system. So that was published about 20 years ago and, and really revolutionized our un understanding of the Earth as a system. But interestingly, of course, we can uh, track human development too on this because fully modern humans evolved about halfway through this ice core record about 200,000 years ago. So we've been through two of these limit cycles of, of warm periods, very short, uh, and then long, very uh, rough cold periods. And for almost all of that period, we were hunter-gatherer societies only. Uh, and it was only in this last warm period, and I'll talk a bit more about that, that the geologists call the Holocene. Everything before the Holocene is, by the way, the Pleistocene. Uh, that's the only time that we've developed agriculture, which has allowed us to develop more complex human societies. So to look at this last bit in a little bit more detail, we can go to a Greenland ice core which is what we do here, which is the last 100,000 years. So again, you see what the geologists note here very clearly, a Pleistocene-Holocene transition that occurred there. But you can see the Holocene quite clearly as the last approximately 12,000 years of reasonably stable climate, certainly stable compared to the period that went before. Again, these are uh, proxy temperatures from a, now a northern hemisphere ice core. And we can track on here the migration and, and uh, movement of humans around the Earth uh, out of Africa about the time this ice core starts, and then moving through Asia into Australia, some Asian populations moving up to Europe and so on. But the point again here is that agriculture developed about 10,000 years ago simultaneously in three or four parts of the world as far as we can see. And that allowed, of course, villages eventually to develop in cities and larger, more complex civilizations of the ones that we've seen in the last uh, two or 3,000 years and the rapidly globalizing one that all of us enjoy today. So this is a, a nice way of, again, looking at the Earth system as a social ecological system and tracking how humans have moved and developed uh, in concert with how the system as a whole uh, has uh, also evolved. But one of the things, of course, we look at in the most recent past is that both humanity is changing but the Earth system is changing quite remarkably. There were uh, some graphs published last year that uh, came out of uh, the SRC uh, and that a couple of my co-authors are around here, I think. Anyway, this is uh, uh, a group of 12 indicators for what we call a human enterprise, complex human societies. And it's the sort of things you would think of that would be pretty core indicators, population, economic growth, urbanization versus rural, primary energy use, resource use, and communication. So these are the basic indicators we're looking at here. 
And we went back to the year 1750 on all of them, and we take it out to 2010, which is the last year we could get pretty comprehensive data for all of these. And we wanted to pick up before the start of the Industrial Revolution. And I'll get on to why we did that in a moment. But you can see how remarkable the growth of the human enterprise is in almost every regard. And you can also see how important this year is in the mid 20th, uh, 20th century, 1950, in terms of rates of change uh, increasing quite remarkably in virtually all of the parameters. It's quite striking in terms of economic development, primary energy use, even population, certainly in terms of, of communication and transport, enormous expansions of human activity uh, after the Second World War. So that's a, a snapshot of, of humanity as a whole. There's a huge and very important discourse about equity issues that are buried in this. I'm not going to go in because I don't have time today. That's an entirely another, another lecture. But it's an extremely important point just to say that all of this is driven basically by about 20% of the human population, by and large. You can take the, the poorest three billion of us out of the picture and you won't get any changes other than the population graph. But that's another story. So the theme, of course, is, is human interaction with the rest of the Earth system. So we wanted to see, is this having any impact on the Earth system or is this, so to speak, under the radar screen? So using the same time frame, we looked at 12 features of the Earth system. We looked at the, the, the ones you might expect, greenhouse gases, stratospheric ozone. This one up here, surface temperature, is the only one that's actually climate per se. The bottom six out of the 12 are actually biosphere, which is, of course, obviously an extremely important part of the Earth's system. So this is sort of geosphere on the top six biosphere here. And again, you can see sharp changes in all of those parameters. Some of them aren't so, so neatly uh, corresponding to 1950. In fact, some of the terrestrial ecosystem ones, we see a lot of human activity well before 1950. But certainly in a lot of the geosphere ones, we again see the sharp 1950 breakpoint of human activity. The important point is that these graphs show two things. One is, in every one of those, we have evidence that it is outside the envelope of the Holocene. Okay, and this is something the geologists want to know about. So from an Earth system science point of view, we can say we have definitely left the Holocene. The second point is the causation. In every one of those, there is a mass of peer-reviewed literature to say, say this is not natural variability. This is due to human pressures of various, uh, various types. So we published these, an earlier version of these in um, 2004 during the IGBP synthesis. And part of the reason we went back to 1750 was triggered by this gentleman. That's Paul Crutzen, who was a vice chair of IGBP at that time. And as we were reporting on our synthesis in the IGBP program in the year 2000 at our scientific committee meeting, the paleo people were reporting on what they were finding in terms of long-term changes in temperature, hydrology, and so on. And they kept referring to the Holocene. And Paul got really agitated and he broke in and said, stop calling it the Holocene. It isn't the Holocene anymore. And then he said we should call it the Anthropocene, obviously for the human pressures. And so he wrote this, this paper with Eugene Stormer who uh, we, we dug Eugene out of the literature. He actually used the word Anthropocene back in the, the 1980s, but then he completely dropped it. So it was really Paul who resuscitated it independently and then pushed it forward. And this comes from the IGBP newsletter. But the important thing that Paul did, uh, and then he, he published the peer-reviewed version in Nature in 2002. But he said Anthropocene should be a new geological epoch, which immediately brings the geologists into the picture. So he immediately brought Earth system science together with the long geological time scale. And he suggested the start date should be the beginning of the Industrial Revolution for pretty obvious reasons from the, uh, the, the enormous increase in use of fossil fuels that followed the, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Late 1700s, in fact, I think, as I recall, his proposal was the invention of the steam engine by James Watt should be the marker for the start of the Anthropocene. So that bubbled away in the IGBP community for quite a while. And it took the geologists the better part of a decade to actually meet the challenge that Paul put forward in the year 2000. So this is the geological time scale or the chronostratigraphic chart. So that's the beginning of planet Earth. 
4.6 billion years ago. And geologists have divided it up into a hierarchy of time periods. And you can see way up on the upper left, you see the Holocene up there. So that's the latest epoch that follows the Pleistocene. So the proposal that Paul made was that the Holocene is ending and we have a new Anthropocene. So that is what is being now considered formally by the stratigraphic community. And they have a really narrow definition. They're not worried about the Earth system. They're not worried about human pressures per se. They want to answer these questions. Have we changed the Earth system such that, and this is where it gets important for them, geological deposits forming now and in the recent past include a fingerprint distinct from that of the Holocene. In other words, they have to see a boundary. They have to see, to see something that's clearly different from the strata below, a difference between above and below. And they want to see something that's globally synchronous. It's happening worldwide. It's not a regional change. So those are the two things that they're looking for. And to examine that, they formed a working group in the year 2009. So it was nearly a decade after Paul proposed the geological epoch that they actually formed a working group. It's chaired by Jan Zolosevich. Uh, and we've done a lot of work remotely as a, as a group. There are 35 of us, most of them from the geological community, but not all of them from the geological community. And we've had three meetings over the last uh, three years. The most important one, I think, was this one in Oslo um, earlier this year, uh, where we, for the first time, really put together all of our work and, talk, and, and made some proposals about what the Anthropocene should be. So the way the group has worked, we've published some special issues in journals that geologists normally read, like this, to talk about the stratigraphic basis, the stratigraphic reality of the Anthropocene and try to get these peer-reviewed papers in the geological uh, literature. But I think we've done some really nice things more broadly. This is a paper that appeared in Science um, and it was earlier this year, 2016, Colin Waters, who's the, the uh, co-convener with Jan uh, of the working group. And that's most of the working group members there. Um, we really sort of put forward in the peer-reviewed literature, yes, this is a stratigraphically distinct geological unit from the Holocene. And there's a lot of evidence. I'll only, only briefly show you what that, that evidence actually is. So th the way we've worked is to spend a lot of time writing peer-reviewed literature, scouring the data, the geological data, Earth system data as well, uh, to put forward the case. And it's only when we've done this over a period of years that we've actually formally um, put together the case. Here's what some of the data look like. So some of the markers you might look, look for if you're a geologist, they have to be distinctly human. In other words, not natural ones. Here's aluminium, concrete, plastics, synthetic fibers. You can see the amount of material that's being put into the Earth system of this type. And again, when you start from 1900, you see the great acceleration absolutely clearly in these geological markers. Uh, and this is a really important one that doesn't exactly start at 1950, but it really rockets up. And that's spheroidal carbonaceous particles, or soot. This comes directly from the burning of fossil fuels. And again, you can see the remarkable increase of the Great Acceleration. And you can split it up by continent again, uh, and you see some differences in continents. But when you add it all up, you get this enormous post-1950 spike. But to give you an idea of, of just what those look like in terms of their magnitude. There's the plastics uh, graph. And the interesting thing is, if you took all of that plastic cumulatively from 1950 and made plastic wrap like you wrap your food in, some of you probably have plastic wrap around the table just now, you could wrap planet Earth with all the plastic wrap that we've produced. So it's an enormous amount. If you looked at aluminium, you could actually cover uh, much of North America in aluminium. You could cover the entire continent of Australia in aluminium. So these are huge amounts. They're dispersed. The small um, particles that, uh, modules that um, plastic degrades to are spread throughout all the oceans now. Can be found everywhere, pretty much globally synchronous. This is a soot particle here, magnified. And again, there are globally synchronous deposits right around the Earth because these are airborne. And so they uh, move around the Earth very, very quickly. Another possibility I won't show, an obvious one, are radionuclides, uh, which again are human made from, from atomic bomb tests. And it's interesting that the stratigraphers like that uh, because it's so 
uh, so clear in the stratigraphic record. It'll be around for 100 to 200,000 years. And they can pin down the start of the Anthropocene to two seconds, which was the detonation time for the first uh, bomb over New Mexico. So they like that one because they can get it really accurately. Uh, but it's quite controversial from a social point of view to use atomic bomb tests at the start of the Anthropocene. So it's likely we'll use something like um, fly ash or soot uh, because it really is symptomatic of the Anthropocene. It's ubiquitous, it's globally synchronous. This has a very long residence time in the strata. It'll be around probably for millions of years. So if um, geologists are around millions of years hence, they will see the Anthropocene uh, boundary, the base, very, very clearly. So, putting all this together, we did a survey uh, about a month or two ago of the Anthropocene Working Group. Critical questions. Is this really stratigraphically real? The vote was 34 yes and one abstaining. Now this is important because a lot of the geologists are saying it's too short and you can't see it because it really isn't stratigraphically real yet. And we say no, it's absolutely clear because of the resolution of a lot of the cores we're looking at. Should it be formalized? Yes, 30 against three abstentions too. So three geologists, these are all geologists by the way, who um, don't like the idea because they're sort of wedded to the Holocene and they don't want to see it end. But they think it's stratigraphically real anyway. This is, a, this is the critical one because when we started in 2009, there was no consensus about when the start date ought to be. But now after looking at the data, you can see absolutely clearly that the Great Acceleration is the preferred start date by the geologists as well. So there's a beautiful integration here of what Earth System Science was saying through the Great Acceleration graphs that we published. And now, when the geologists have looked at the strata, they see the Great Acceleration all over the planet in all sorts of things they look at. So they're quite convinced. The only other one that uh, was talked about was a diachronous start, and that's for those people who don't think it should be formalized because they like the idea of an earlier Anthropocene of human agriculture um, and so on. But interestingly, um, the chair of the uh, subcommittee on quaternary stratigraphy, which is the group that looks after the last part of the, the record, made a really interesting comment at a meeting in Oslo. He said, humans are acknowledged and accepted as part of the Holocene. So the human markers are actually in the Pleistocene as well. But the point they make is that they don't see any evidence, strong evidence of human modification of the trajectory of the whole Earth system until you get to the Great Acceleration in mid-1950. So they're now, after a lot of discussion, there's a really strong consensus that this is going to go forward as the proposed start date for the Anthropocene. Now, some, some questions as to whether it's going to be a, a 1945 uh, date. Uh, this, by the way, I won't go into this. This is just a proposed date. You can do two things if you're a geologist. You can propose a date and assemble evidence around it, or you can propose a golden spike. One stratigraphic, one core that shows quite clearly when the new period, time period started. A GSSP or golden spike, which what we'll, is probably what we'll go for, uh, but it won't necessarily be radionuclides as indicated here. It could be, uh, could be nitrate. Nitrate is, is appearing in, in cores all over the planet at the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Could be spheroidal carbon particles. So we've got more work to do to nominate what's going to be the golden spike, because that's what we're going to go for. And that will be put forward formally in about three or four years' time. And then it's got to go th to, through three levels of committees before it'll be approved. So if it gets approved in my lifetime, I'll be happy. I'm not sure that'll happen. But given the long lifetime of the, the, the uh, chronostratigraphic record, um, this is pretty fast work, actually. So, some comments on, on the beginning of the Anthropocene. They said there's gradual but diachronous human influence right throughout the Holocene. You can see it quite clearly. But the point that the geologists make now, and that's largely through the influence of our community who are working on, on systems approaches, they say the Earth's system carbon nitrogen cycles on, remained broadly stable over most of the Holocene. And that's the point they make as well now. But this globally synchronous change is clearly intensified in the Great Acceleration. So they want something that's absolutely clear, absolutely sharp, unambiguous. And so this to them provides the pragma pragmatic position for the base 
were start of the Anthropocene. So we've made a lot of progress since 2009 in the Anthropocene Working Group. Um, and uh, hopefully now we can start jumping through the hoops that are required to get this formalized. But now I want to switch to the um, Earth System Science perspective because I think it's more inter interest of, of, uh, to people here and the work you're doing. And I think there was a very interesting paper that we published as a working group uh, earlier this year in Earth's Future trying to merge or integrate stratigraphic and Earth System Science approaches to the Anthropocene. And I think we all learned a lot in, in, in putting, this, um, putting this paper together. There are some beautiful figures that came out of this one. One is a history of Earth's climate. And these panels start with the entire picture from four billion years ago to the present, which is the first one. You can see a, a small but steady cooling trend from the beginning of Earth all the way through uh, toward uh, the present time. You can see some snowball Earth uh, events there, some glaciations and so on. But the, the interesting thing, and I'll get on to this in a moment, is the incredibly important role of the biosphere in all this. The biosphere appears pretty quickly, by the way, after the Earth, uh, after the geosphere appears. But the interesting thing is the sun is actually becoming more intense through this period, and yet the Earth is cooling. Why? It's because of life. It's because of the biosphere. So we can see then in increasingly fine resolution um, how the climate has changed. These bottom four are the more, most important ones. 60 million years ago, we had a spike that may be similar to what humans are doing now, called the Paleo-Eocene Thermal Maximum. Then if we go to the Pleistocene, which is basically this, we start to see this very systemic pattern of limit cycles, glacial interglacial cycles. And we see a switch from a 40,000 periodicity, year periodicity, to 100,000 year periodicity, and an increase in amplitude. And it was a switch. And there's been a lot of debate in the climate literature about why that occurred, and I think they're going up the wrong track and looking at it in a cause-effect way, when in fact, I think Martin Schaeffer actually has the answer. It was a, a case of phase locking of, of there are several periodicity in Earth's orbital parameters, one at about 20-some thousand years, one at 40, and one in 100. And as ice sheets grow bigger, uh, they locked into the 100,000 year rather than the 40,000 year uh, periodicity. And that seems to fit the, the evidence too of increasing amplitude is also correlated with increasing size of the ice sheets. So anyway, there's some really nice um, science to be done around that. This then is the last 60,000 years of the uh, last ice age. There's the Holocene and here's the Holocene itself. By the way, the golden spike for the beginning of the Holocene sits about here. And the golden spike physically sits in Copenhagen, Denmark. Sits in an uh, ice lab, and it's one of the Greenland ice cores. And it's at the point where CO2 finally steadies out after the rise of, from 180 to about 280. And so there's a physical golden spike. You can go see it when you're in Copenhagen. But then this is one of the most interesting um, graphs that we produced. Uh, and it was built on a, on a graph that Tim Letton had done back in 2005, I think which actually looks at the coevolution of the geosphere and the biosphere and how they interact through time and how the system as a whole uh, uh, is shaped by both. So you get interactions of geospheric changes on the biosphere, uh, which ca sometimes can be quite rapid, bolide strikes, for example. The biosphere is interesting because it has quite significant changes, but tends, they tend to be much slower changes as life evolves. And the classic one here is the great oxidation event about two, two and a half billion years ago, which totally changed the atmosphere from a reducing to an oxidizing atmosphere. And life has maintained the atmosphere in an incredibly steady composition for a very long time. So this is a nice way of saying this is how the Earth's system has co-evolved in its simplest uh, deconvolution. You can deconvolute it into the geosphere and the biosphere, which is what we do here. So now if we look at what the Anthropocene means for those two aspects of the Earth's system, uh, the geosphere and the biosphere, and we'll start with the biosphere. Uh, we can see some estimates of, of mass extinctions. Obviously, if, if you look back in time, there have been five uh, great mass extinctions, all in the last 500 million years. Uh, but if you look at the threatened species under the IUCN, we look at all the different forms of life that we have today, you see that some of them are approaching very high levels of 50, 60 percent. Great uh, mass extinction events are normally defined as 75% of species going extinct. So here you see the five previous mass extinctions. There are the dinosaurs. So we're approaching it, but we're not yet there. Those are the threatened species. Actual extinction rates are down here about 1% to 2%. So the point is, 
if people say we're in the sixth great mass extinction event, no, we're not. We're headed for it, and if we're not careful, we'll get there with the threatened species. But there is still, hopefully, time to keep extinctions down in here, which certainly would not qualify as a mass extinction event. Nevertheless, there are huge changes to the biosphere. If we look at the ocean, um, you can see that uh, this is a cartoon way of saying that humans are now going down the trophic levels in terms of our um, uh, exploitation of the marine biosphere. And of course, there's been a lot done on land too. Some interesting and, and quite worrying statistics. Um, half of all wildlife have been killed in the last 40 years, for example. Uh, and uh, we can look at the domesticates that we've done. That's the Anthropocene chicken. So when I was a lad growing up, this was the chicken I knew. This is the chicken that we know today. It's over four times bigger in mass. And that's obviously due to human manipulation of that, of that animal. Uh, and the interesting thing, stratigraphers actually like this because when they look in the stratigraphic record, remember they use fossils too as part of the stratigraphic record, they will see the difference in wishbone and in leg between the Holocene chicken and the Anthropocene chicken. So this may be a, a biological marker for the Anthropocene. But the most striking thing is when we look at, at domesticates and, and ourselves, and if we look at terrestrial vertebrate biomass, you get a remarkable outcome. All vertebrate wildlife, you know, it's birds, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals, their total mass is an order of magnitude less than us, humans, just humans. So if we took all 7.3 some billion of us and added our mass together, that would be 10 times all the wildlife on Earth, terrestrial wildlife. And when you add our domesticates in, they make up nearly two thirds. Pigs, chickens, cattle, what have you. So humans and our domesticates now comprise about 97% of all the biomass on the terrestrial part of Earth. So that gives you a feeling for what the Anthropocene is really like. It's in terms of just whether species exist or not, the mass of species is just, uh, is just phenomenally skewed. If we look at the climate now, and we go back to uh, this Antarctic ice core that I showed first, we can examine the systemic nature of this a bit more. And we can look at this limit cycle in terms of having two phases or two states, the cold glacial one. I've just uh, marked two of them, but you could mark those as well. And they tend to be fairly long slow descent into them, slow growth of the ice sheets. And then we have these intervening warm periods, the interglacials. There are four of them on, on, this, uh, on this graph. And so you see this regular oscillator between the glacial periods and the warm periods. So if we look at this in, in terms of limit cycles and look at the entire ice core, that's temperature. But those other two are greenhouse gases. You can see CO2 and methane. Certainly in the CO2 record, you can see how closely coupled it is to global temperature. Uh, there's very good r physical reasons for that. But of course, what's remarkable, remarkable about this is, I don't think we can, can we see that? Yeah. If you look at the variation in CO2 between an ice age and a warm period, it goes between 180 and 280 or 300. In other words, it's capped at the bottom and the top really tightly. Absolutely uh, systematic of a complex system. And you can see the same thing for methane, too. It operates within a, a very tight operating range. And of course, temperature does the same as well. So again, this is very symptomatic of a single complex system. The tight linkages between these in terms of their phasing, and also the fact that their uh, variability is capped top and bottom. But of course, what we can do now is put the contemporary changes. That blue arrow up there is drawn to scale. So that's the change in CO2 compared to the limit cycle that the planet's been in uh, during the last 400,000 years. You can do the same thing for methane. Methane looks like this. Uh, and that, again, that's drawn to scale a bit harder to see because it runs into the, the bars over there. So you would expect, of course, that if, if there's a tight linkage between CO2, methane, and global average temperature, you should actually see that. And indeed, you do. So when you look at what's happening in the contemporary period, these are the actual observations from about 1860 to the present. And again, you can see, um, not long after the Great Acceleration, really around 1970, you see the temperature going up very, very sharply. But we need to put this in a longer term perspective. There's been some, some beautiful work done by the Pages project of the old IGBP, which is 
done a 2,000 year temperature reconstruction. You can actually now get reconstructions all the way back through the Holocene. But this one is nice because it shows natural variability, medieval warm period, little ice age. By the way, the medieval warm period does not appear at all in the global record. You say, why is that so? That's because it was hemispheric. Very strong warming in the North Atlantic region, cooling in the Southern Hemisphere. So it was a redistribution of heat rather than a warming of the planet. And so what's happening now, of course, is quite different. So we see the spike that, of the human-driven uh, uh, temperature change at the end here. Again, that's drawn to scale. We can estimate what the natural envelope of variability ought to be from the Earth's orbital parameters. And that's what Colin Summerhays has done in, in this piece. And you can see that, that how nicely the natural variability actually does fall within the variability you would expect from orbital changes uh, in, in the Earth. And the odd volcano thrown in as well. But again, you see how remarkable uh, the shifts that we're seeing now. So what we can do is, is look then to the future and look at the IPCC projections. This is from the fifth assessment report. Uh, this is the lowest emission scenario, that's the highest emission scenario, uh, and they've put the uh, zero line about, uh, about where we are now, about 2000, I think around 2005. So you see we can go anywhere from about a degree up to about four degrees, or you need to add close to a degree to get uh, pre-industrial. But the point is, we need to put that in a longer term time frame. So we're going to do that now. This is the graph I just showed you of the observed temperature rise, and when you put the IPCC projections on at 2100, they look like that. So you see when we look at that, you see exactly what you see on the CO2 and methane spikes. You see in the longer term perspective, variability, and then you see a real rupture, an absolute spike in terms of climatic change. So from an Earth system point of view, this is a, a really big spike. The average temperature difference between an ice age and a warm period is about four or five degrees. So this is equivalent to that entire temperature difference. So uh, this is what we're looking at. Best case scenario is in here. And most scientists think we're pretty close to being committed to two degrees now, uh, given the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere, given the fact that we can't go to zero emissions tomorrow, we're gonna have to phase out, that we're really trying hard to get between 1.5 and two, but we're committed, I think, to pretty close to two degrees. And of course, the worst case scenario business as usual, takes you up to four degrees and maybe, maybe even higher. And that's a pretty big challenge for us to be able to cope with. A temperature change of geological proportions uh, in just a hundred years time. Now it's interesting to actually quantify these rates of change, which we recently did in that, in that Earth's Future paper. And we can do that for a number of important parameters, one of which, of course, is CO2. Uh, and the, the last time we saw a strong CO2 increase uh, was during the last deglaciation when you saw CO2 go up sharply. Uh, and we can say now that over the last uh, two decades, uh, CO2 has been rising about 100 times faster than it did during that uh, deglaciation period. If you go back to that thing I showed you about uh, 56 million years ago, the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, that was thought to be triggered by a bolide strike which then caused a lot of outgassing of, of methane and CO2 from ocean sediments. And we, they estimated the CO2 rise there, which is the biggest scene in Earth history. And ours is still 10 times faster than the PETM. So uh, one of the ironic records set by the Anthropocene over 4.6 billion years of Earth history is we've caused the fastest rise in atmospheric CO2 that, that the Earth has ever seen, as far as we can determine. Since 1970, which is getting on toward half a century now, uh, the temperature rise is about 170 times the background rate uh, over the last 7,000 years since the mid-Holocene. And we've seen a very, very uh, gradual cooling since then. So not only is it 170 times faster, it's going in the opposite direction. And of course, as we put CO2 into the atmosphere, some of it's absorbed in the ocean. This increases the acidity of the ocean. And what we see here is that the rate at which that's occurring is unparalleled for at least the last 300 million years. So again, from an Earth system science point of view, it's pretty unequivocal that we've, we've got a change in the state of the Earth system that's occurring now. Uh, and all of, these, uh, all of this data is indicating that it's, it's far, far um, out of the Holocene, Holocene uh, envelope of variability. So uh, what I'll try to do in the last little bit is to put this in a complex systems point of view uh, with some cartoons. This one we produced for that Earth's future paper. And we're trying to interpret what's going on 
in terms of the Holocene now, in terms of this ball and cup model of a of stable state of any complex system. And so what we've said is that there's a, obviously a, a natural envelope, a envelope of natural variability. And we saw that in that graph of temperature. And you can just visualize it here simply as the Earth rattling around uh, within the Holocene. And it does, you know, there's a lot of variation, a lot of variation in the hydrological cycle, variation in the biosphere. But it's limited within a Holocene envelope. But the basin of attraction that would keep you in the Holocene is actually even deeper than that. So we have some leeway to change the system and it would relax back down to the Holocene. So the question is, when did we actually transgress that? And our argument, as opposed to those who propose an early Anthropocene, is that a lot of the human pressures we put on through the Holocene, early agriculture, industrial revolution, and so on, may have gone outside of typical Holocene variability, but it didn't go out of the Holocene basin of attraction, which is pretty deep. Our interpretation is that it was only about the start of the Great Acceleration that we started moving out of the Holocene basin of attraction. So that's our interpretation from uh, uh, a complex systems point of view of when the Anthropocene started. The point I want to make here though is the Holocene is a state or uh, one end of a, a limit cycle. The Anthropocene is uh, no, nothing close to that yet. It's simply a trajectory going out. So if we look at the possible trajectories of what the Anthropocene means, we in a cartoon way said, well, you could imagine at least two possibilities. So here's a Holocene cup, there's the start of the Great Acceleration, there we are in 2016. And we said, we know that previous interglacials, warm periods, have actually been warmer than the Holocene. And so we postulate that there may be conditions that we haven't yet breached which would keep us in an interglacial, not necessarily a Holocene, but an interglacial state, at least in terms of the climate. And that's really what we ought to be aiming for. So this state of the Earth system would be something that would correspond to the Paris climate target, 1.5 to 2 degrees, and would re require a much better job of biosphere stewardship to turn around a lot of those trends and changes in the biosphere. The other trajectory may lead to something that's quite different. We go out of anything resembling an interglacial state into something that resembles one of the much warmer states that occurred four, five, 15, 20 million years ago. Greenhouse conditions, loss of most of the polar ice, maybe not all of Antarctica, and that would lead to climate chaos. It'd be a very, very different climate than the one that we've evolved in and, and, and uh, developed our societies in, and probably the sixth great extinction event. So these are two very contrasting trajectories of the, of the Earth system. And I'll close by some work that's in progress here, which uh, I'll show you, but is not quotable yet. It's looking at these various trajectories of the Earth system and looking at the Earth system as, as, as a coupled integrated geosphere biosphere from about 3.5 to 4 billion years ago. And of course, back at that time, there were no humans. In fact, there was no terrestrial biosphere back at that time. It was a, a marine biosphere. And then, of course, we come to the Pleistocene, and there were indeed humans there, but we portray them as being very small within the, within the biosphere, completely embedded in the biosphere, two-way interaction, the biosphere impacted on humans, but even in the Pleistocene, the humans at least locally impacted on the biosphere. But very small players in terms of the whole Earth system. And then we get to the Holocene, where we start developing agriculture, villages, and cities. We're still, of course, embedded in the biosphere, where human societies are bigger, we're bigger in number, we're more complex, and so on. Still inter interacting in a two-way relationship with the biosphere. But in terms of the whole Earth system, we actually don't see much change at the Earth system level. The Anthropocene is something quite different. And in a cartoon way, we've looked at it like this, where we're still, at least biophysically, we're embedded in the biosphere quite strongly. But now we're a very large part of the Earth system. We affect and interact with the biosphere as we always have, being influenced by it and influencing it, but at a much grander scale. But now we've got two new arrows. This, for example, would be genetic ma manipulation of species. It's the techno technological ability to bypass normal biospheric processes and yet affect the biosphere. And we can do that in many different ways now. Think of all the pesticides, for example, products of, of what Peter Half calls the technosphere. So you might think of this bit that's sort of now starting to hang outside of the biosphere, but still within the Earth system, 
there's this huge technological capability we have to bypass or interfere with a lot of the processes of the biosphere. But of course, now we have a big error that goes directly into the geosphere. And that's by taking fossil fuels which are buried outside of the active part of the Earth's system, outside of the biosphere, and burning them and putting them straight into the geosphere, the atmosphere, bypassing um, the interaction with the biosphere. So now human societies are much bigger, they're much more complex. They're still embedded in the Earth system, but through our, our, our sort of mental view of things, through our economic systems, uh, through our technosphere, we've got this, this odd relationship of being embedded in the biosphere biophysically, which we still are, but mentally more and more humans are disconnecting, and hence the need for reconnecting to the biosphere in a mental way and in a technological way. So we've tried to capture that complexity in that sort of diagram. But then I think the, the, the master diagram came from Martin Scheffer, which now is again looking at that glacial and intergalactic uh, cycling as, as a limit cycle, uh, and the two axes here are temperature and then lagging it is sea level. And you can see the 100,000 year oscillations between cold, low sea level conditions, warm, high sea level conditions. We've put pre-industrial Holocene about where that line is. So this is indicating that some interglacials are actually warmer than the Holocene in that limit cycle. This is our planet Earth now. This is the Anthropocene where it's just a trajectory. It's not a new limit cycle. It's still pretty close to what might be interglacial conditions. But in fact, our choice here, and this is depicted as a bifurcation point going into the future. And it's not really a natural bifurcation point. It's, it's a human one of what Martin has called and what we call a governed Earth and what we might call an ice-free Earth or something close to it, which we could access with the amount of fossil fuels that we have. So the question we're exploring in this, in this work that we're um, that's being led here at the Resilience Center is what does it take to actually get this loop? Because this loop probably will not occur naturally. In other words, if you took the pressure off now, the Earth will probably not drop back into that limit cycle. And there's good modeling to say we've already kicked the Earth out of the 100,000 year cycling. So the question is, what is it going to take to get us into this sort of trajectory in what you might call a governed Earth that caps temperature rise to no more than two degrees has a much higher level of biosphere stewardship and so on. We can get some insights into what it takes by looking at the past. There's pre-industrial. Mid-Holocene was actually up in here. It was a bit warmer. And the Eemian may even be a little bit warmer. We're not sure. So we still may be within that envelope of, of interglacials. But not much further back in time, you can see the Pliocene and the Mid-Miocene. This was two to three degrees warmer. Mid-Miocene was four degrees warmer. And we can start to get some insights into what the Earth looks like. Two to three degrees uh, warmer, you probably have 20 meters higher sea level rise. Mid-Miocene, probably 40 to 50 meters sea level rise. You've lost all of the northern hemisphere ice in the mid-Miocene and much of the Antarctic ice. So this is just work in progress, but this is a sort of um, approach we're taking to understanding what the Anthropocene actually means and the fact that now we have become such a powerful player in the Earth system that we have the opportunity to design and even push and manipulate the trajectory of the Earth system. So I'll stop there. And if we have any questions or discussion, I'm happy to answer them. I see Johan's back there too, so we can actually elaborate on some of this, this later stuff as well. 